Well, hello and welcome to The Late Show. So good to have your company tonight. And tonight we're dealing with a very important subject, the subject of racism. Here in the UK, we're coming towards the end of Black History Month, and there's been a great deal of emphasis upon the whole issue of uh, black and white and colours and the difference and why the difference and trying to create um, equality in our country. Well, we're going to be looking at it not so much from what's been going on in the country, but what the Bible has to say and how it is that even in the churches that there still seems to be a separation. I'm pleased to say that with me in the studio is uh, Tim Vince. I'm very much looking forward to your contribution and your input, Tim. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. And also with us in the studio is uh, Paulette Monteiro. And Paulette, it's lovely to have you with us tonight. And uh, Paulette's going to be talking about her own experiences and uh, also sharing about the church she attends where equality is something that has been worked hard at and um, certainly looks as if it's been achieved. So we're looking forward to it very much. I want to start by reminding you of one of the greatest revivals that took place. It took place in the year of 1906. It took place in a city called Los Angeles, and it's called the Azusa Street Revival. Uh, an amazing time where the Spirit of God was outpoured, and uh, many believe that that was the beginning of what we know as Pentecostalism in the world today. The person that God used to initiate the Azusa Street Revival was this gentleman called William Seymour. Now, William Seymour has been described, maybe unkindly, as a one-eyed black man. He certainly came from uh, parents who'd been involved in slavery. William Seymour became a Christian, a believer, and he wanted to go along to a Bible college. And he went to one in a place called Houston, and uh, its principal was a gentleman called Charles Parham. And when I wrote about the Azusa Street Revival, I wrote and said that um, there was only one problem at the Bible school. Charles Parham was a racist or a strict segregationist, as he preferred to call himself. He wouldn't allow Seymour to sit in the classroom along with the white students. Such was Seymour's hunger to learn more of God. He was willing to suffer having to sit outside the classroom with the door left slightly ajar so that Seymour could hear what was being taught by the teacher inside, but he wasn't allowed to sit with the other white students. And when it came to the point where Charles Parham prayed for his students in the classroom to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, all Seymour could do was sit on the outside and say, please don't forget me too, Lord. So powerful. Mm. The amazing thing is that God didn't forget Seymour. Instead, he saw him and knew his heart and used him to begin a movement in the Christian church, which today has got literally millions upon millions of people in it, the Pentecostal, the Assemblies of God, the Elim churches, all the different offshoots that there are. Mm. Tim, I remember you saying to us mm. that you went to the 100th anniversary for the 1906 Azusa Street I Revival. Did. And it was a downtown or just, you know, in the poorer part of downtown um, Los Angeles, 2006. And I went to this little chapel where um, William Seymour, you see, he wouldn't want to claim any credit. He was such a godly man. He, he, he basically hid under a box in prayer. So the revival was happening because of his absolute persistent prayer. Um, and pleading with the Lord, and, and it, it did take off. And by the way, it wasn't accepted by, by all the posh churches of Los Angeles. You know, it literally just came from the power of God, against, totally against the grain of the culture That's of, right. of that time. And, and many yeah. of the ministers in Los Angeles um, said to their congregants, you must not go to Azusa Street. Mm. Yeah, no? exactly. uh, Somebody actually said it was the work of the devil rather than the Lord. But you see, colour didn't make any difference uh, to God. No. He loves each one of us, and that's what we want to share tonight. So, Tim, let me start by saying, if we said to you a definition of racism, what would you say? 
Yeah, I'd, I'd firstly say it's not a, a religious or a, a, an atheist position. It comes, it comes from some sort of deep prejudice for, um, against those who are different to you. Uh, you know, what they call the other, someone that you don't, um, you know, maybe relate to. And then it's, it, it's not dependent on whether it's an individual. It can be prejudice towards a whole people, to prejudice towards an individual. And it can come from a, an individual or from a community, that prejudice, or from a, a religious, a theological perspective, or dare I say, a sort of um, Darwinianist survival of the fittest perspective, you know, that basically devalues a man and woman made in God's image. And there's only one race, the human race, that God has created. And that's, that's the problem with any theological position. They are denying that basic element of God creating male and female in his image. Wow, that was good. I think he said it all, Paul, there. But yeah. if we said to you, give us your description, definition of, of racism, what would you say? I'd say that um, racism is definitely discri discrimination. So from one, um, like um, Tim said, from one individual to um, a certain race or from a ra one race to another. Um, I would also say, for me, racism comes out of fear um, and um, it's fear of the unknown. Uh, often we see that, you know, someone is fearful of a certain race and then they become obviously racist. Yeah. So you mean a, a white person could be fearful when they see somebody of a different colour, is that what you mean? Yes, but that, that would be deeply, like I think you said, deeply ingrained. So that is something that comes, you know, from generations, past generations. And sometimes I would say nowadays, if you ask a, someone, a child of someone that has been racist, it's something that's been cultivated in their home, so there's no longer they can't really explain it anymore. So back then they could explain why, but then as it has been passed on the generations, it's no longer, they're no longer able to explain why they do not like a certain race. It's just, they grew up like this. I totally agree with that, by the way, because I, I visited South Africa while it, the apartheid was still there, and I've visited many times since, and there was definitely a fear. There's definitely a fear, but but also, you know, really a, a nasty edge as well. Really, hate, it's hate. It's not just discrimination, there's a, hate. You, and, and we know that evil can rise up within any of us. Mm. And if you give way to hatred, you know, I'm afraid it completely eats up your soul. Mm. And that's what happened in South Africa. When I wrote to you a few days ago and said, we're gonna talk about racism on Wednesday night's Late Show, you wrote back and you gave an example of the new prime minister. Yes. And he seemingly on one of the Sky interviews that you saw talked about experiencing it himself. Yeah. Can you tell us what that was? Yeah, um, I, I will try and find it. I think, did I WhatsApp it to you or did I email it? No, you didn't. You sent me an email. And oh just dear. Um, so I turned off my computer, so talk among yourselves and I'll try and find, I'll try and <laughs> well, find the email. While Tim's looking, yeah. this is live. Yeah. 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 And we ought to say we're having a few problems at the moment with our, our emails and our texts, but please do write in to the live at revelationtv.com com and uh, or send a text to the number that you see there on the screen and hopefully within a few minutes the ipad will be with me and we'll be able to read out so that you can share your experiences and talk to us um just about your ex what you've sensed in terms of racism but come on paulette but let me start by saying paulette ju just tell us a little bit about your background because you you, you didn't start in this country did you so no. Tell us where you started. So I was born in France, mm -hmm. south of France. Um, and then um, my mum took us to Africa, so my big sister and myself, to Congo. And we lived there for three, three years. So I was five years old. And when I came back to France, I was eight, nine years old, yes. OK. And then you came to this country about 20 years ago, you said? Yes. yes. OK. So if I said to you, I'm going to ask you a little bit about your own experience later on, but if I said to you, do you know of anyone who's experienced racism? And if so, could you give us an example? Yes, I do know quite a few people who've experienced racism. Um, one of the, the experience that's quite fresh in my memory, because I was talking to a work colleague um, last week about this, and he mentioned an experience he had in the UK, where if, I think he said, the 80s, um, because this is of a certain age. Uh, so he said in the 80s, he was just going to school 
um, and then he was crossing the United Zebra Crossing and a car just slowed down and the, per the gentleman who was white in his driving seat just rolled down his window and spat in his face. Mm -hmm. And he just, he just said that he was obviously in his, I think it was in his teen years, and he said he, he didn't know what to do, so he stood there. Um, and people, he said people had witnessed that what had happened and no one came to kind of check if he was okay. Um, so he said he stood there not knowing what to do and, and then after he just wiped, you know, the spat and then carried on Horrible. going where he was going. Horrible. Yeah. Dear, dear. Horrible. Yeah, so Rishi Sunak, when he was in the summer election campaign for leadership, the other, the other campaign, the one that happened, <laughs> um, uh, he was interviewed by Kay Burley on Sky News. And um, he, this is exactly what he said. He said he had been fortunate not to have endured a lot of racism growing up, but there was one incident that had stayed with him. He was out with his younger brother. He, this is his words now, my younger brother and sister. Um, I was pretty young, probably a mid-teenager, and we were out at a fast food restaurant, and I was just looking after them. There were people sitting nearby. It was the first time I'd experienced it, just saying some very unpleasant things. The P word, he said, and it stung. Um, by the way, yeah, he's Indian, not Pakistani. But you know, that's the thing. It's, it's like a blanket um, mm. devaluing of a whole group of people. Anyway, he said, and it stung. I still remember it. It's seared in my memory. You can be insulted in many different ways. However, he said, he said he can't conceive of that happening today in the UK. I think he's, he's sort of running for, elect <laughs> for high office, so. It is still pretty, the prejudice is pretty bad in, in Britain. And, um, yeah, and, and I think we'll find that tonight. And if we get our emails and texts mm. working in a few moments, mm. we'll be hearing examples of it. But w we don't particularly tonight want to be talking about it in a general sense. We mm. want to talk about it in, in, a, in a church sense yeah. and in a Christian sense. Mm. And, and, and why is it that it exists even within the church? I, I was doing research today. And I came across a quotation, and this is with regards to America. But uh, an independent report that has come out uh, from a, a public religion research uh, institute said that if, you like, if you're looking to recruit people for white supremacist causes in America, you're more likely to be more successful by hanging around the parking lot of the churches than you are of sitting around local coffee shops. And they said that's the same whether you're talking about evangelical churches, Protestant churches, or Roman Catholic church. If that's mm. the case, it's a shocking situation that we're in with regards to a church at the moment. Well, we want to uh, start tonight by um, showing a piece that was recorded just a few weeks ago on the Our Mornings programme, Yemi and uh, Sai were interviewing a gentleman called Dr Clifford Hill and he was talking about his experiences. He's someone who is, is a white person but uh, he had one of the largest multicultural churches in the UK back in the 60s yeah. and 70s. In Tim, you, you know him far I, better I do, than I do. I do know Clifford Hill very well. He's one of the great Christian authors of, of our time, of, of our lifetime. He's been writing for decades and decades. So in the 1960s, his church was in Tottenham. Um, he received a lot of abuse himself for the fact that he had, um, you know, those from many different, you know, Afro-Caribbeans and others in his, in his church. And he even, they even wrote on the pavement that, the, you know, the racists calling him a nigger lover and things like that. But he persevered. So he, he probably um, is the outstanding Christian leader in Britain today on, on this subject. And he's written many books on the subject. One, one he's written on the legacy of the slave trade called Free at Last, question uh, mark. Um, in other words, there is a, a legacy, there's a legacy of prejudice, but there's, there is, in reality, there's, there's a leg, an economic legacy as well. So he's very frank and open about that. Okay, so here is 95-year-old uh, Dr. Clifford Hill. The research for this, I suppose, 50 years ago, so all wow. that time, um, uh, I was sent out to um, uh, the Caribbean by the British Council of Churches in 1961 
uh, because of the work that I was doing among the um, uh, Windrush generation in London. Uh, I was sent out there really to uh, visit um, in Barbados and Trinidad and spent quite some time in Trinidad, uh, in uh, Jamaica. Um, and uh, my job was to establish um, links between the churches in uh, uh, the Caribbean and those uh, in London who were receiving the migrants. Um, and uh, whilst I was there, I, I began some research. I am a sociologist as well as a pastor. Um, this is my church in London, uh, High Cross Congregational Church. Uh, these people outside, as you can see here, um, are ones who came late, who couldn't get in. We, the church seated a thousand and uh, the hall seated another 500. So we had 1,500 people inside, but um, uh, many people came late to church. Uh, and th th these were the people who were outside, who wow. couldn't get in. Um, wow. And this was on Commonwealth Sunday, uh, 1961. Um, and um, we were broadcasting on the BBC Home Service and on the Caribbean Service as well. I used to do a weekly broadcast for BBC on the BBC Caribbean service, uh, a sort of letter from London giving information of what was happening in the migrant communities. Wow. Uh, but uh, my research, I started all that time ago, 50 years ago, um, and uh, I, I never published it until um, this year. Uh, I decided in that the, the uh, atmosphere in, in Britain really has not responded as much as I'd hoped um, in terms of integration. Uh, and I shared this with some of my um, my uh, West Indian uh, uh, brothers and sisters um, and friends, uh, and we got together and uh, uh, through the um, Movement for Justice and Reconciliation that, that, that I was one of the founders of, uh, we uh, put together this research, and um, that's where we um, produced this book. The, 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 the great thing about this research is it shows that the legacy of slavery uh, is, is still um, very virulent in this. In, in this. The, the, the roots of um, uh, discrimination actually go back to colonial slavery, where the, the, the planters simply took any girl that they wanted for their sexual pleasures. Uh, and of course, the progeny, uh, the babies, uh, some would um, be uh, white or uh, uh, very fair skin. Uh, and those, the, the planters did not want to send them into the field gangs. Um, uh, so uh, they gave them special duties as servants in the, in the household, the white household. Um, and uh, this established the uh, white pyramid, the, the, the pyramid uh, in race relations with white at the top of the pyramid. Uh, and that it has um, become institutionalized in our society. Uh, when I was in Jamaica 50 years ago, uh, if I went into a bank, I, I would always be served by a white person, never a black person. Uh, and, and that uh, prejudice still exists today in, ja in Jamaica. The white pyramid is still very much there. And the only way we are going to overcome this is, is through, through greater um, positive discrimination to enable black people really to succeed in, in society. Uh, that, that's the kind of thing that we will be talking about in Parliament um, next week. Tuesday of next week, the 18th of October, is when this book is going to be... Um, uh, is going to be um, uh, Launched, yes, that's right. Um, and it goes right back to my very first book. This is my first book that was um, published in 1958 uh, at the time of the Notting Hill riots. Um, uh, and uh, 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 here we need to do exactly the sort of things that I was advocating in, in this book um, to uh, enable those who are of darker skin to, to be um, uh, in, in more 
prominent places in society. Can I please ask you, Dr. Clifford, um, the, you mentioned yeah. now uh, Stephen Tim's MP is going to be launching this book next week yeah, in right. the Parliament reception. What is it our yeah. governments can do? Is there anything you're trying to put forward for our governments to, to enlighten them about this particular subject? Well, undoubtedly, uh, obviously, we're also talking about... Um, um, well, uh, how to how to change attitudes in society, and that's what this book is, is all about. Um, uh, but uh, positive discrimination is one of the things that we have to do. We have to just get used to treating um, uh, people of all colours uh, exactly the the, the same uh, the same um, uh, standard, the same status, really. Stop racism, yes, that's what a, a very good... What, a, good what about our churches? Are they doing enough? Could they be doing more? And what advice could you give to maybe some of the pastors who are watching us today? Yes, certainly churches ought to be doing a lot more than they are, really. Uh, um, so, so many churches um, uh, have very, very few um, black people in um, uh, positions of influence in, in the church. Um, the churches are still very much white institutions. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the trouble there is that there are plenty of black churches, but very few really mixed churches. Okay. The, uh, some of the black churches are the, the biggest congregations in the country, um, but they have very, very few white people. Uh, and the same goes for, for the white churches, the institutions... Um, are all built up that way. And so that uh, we, we don't really get into um, uh, complete integration. So, Dr. My, Clifford... My, my, my church did way back in the 80s. We were the, the only fully multi, multicultural church in Britain. Um, my church uh, uh, in High Cross Tottenham, right on the high street, uh, near, where, near the Spurs, um, uh, and... Uh, uh, my church seated a thousand. Um, we were f full for most, you know, most Sundays. Um, in uh, in ten years in Tottenham, I doubt if I preached to ever less than five hundred people on a Sunday. Wow. And it was a fully mixed congregation, black and white. Great. I do love listening to Dr. Clifford Hill, and he's had an amazing ministry over the years. And uh, we just thank him for sharing that uh, interview with us on an Our Mornings program a couple of weeks ago. And, and I need to say that when he kept talking about the book being launched, it didn't actually happen on October the 18th because a few other things were going on in Parliament at that particular time because it was going to be in the Houses of Parliament. So a new date has been set and it's going to be launched in November in the Houses of Parliament then. So it will be an interesting time and I've certainly got my name down to get one of the books as soon as they're out so that I can have a read of it. Well, he raised lots of, of interesting points there when he talked. Mm. And, and Paulette, I guess this is where we need to bring you in. But before we do that, let me just say, uh, we haven't quite got emails tonight, but um, we found someone that is getting them and they're sending them through to my phone. So let me just say, uh, Eddie, thank you so much. Eddie wrote, good evening panel. The most revered Christian in the fight against racism was Dr. Martin Luther King. King is not admired by some evangelical Christians because he was a universalist. But I mean, Paulette, he, he has, he's had a mighty impact upon uh, understanding of uh, equality, hasn't he? Yes, mm. this is a really good reference, um, you know, for the black community. I guess we all know him. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And, and, and Les, you've written and said, uh, we should remember Revelation 7, 9. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, all tribes and people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully we're going to be receiving lots more emails and texts, so uh, you can start, start to send in your comments and uh, your thoughts and uh, your reasons maybe as to why racism exists in this country and uh, whether you've experienced it as well. So, Paulette, I've got a copy of your book 
behind the headline, which tells behind you the smile. Behind the smile, sorry, not the headline. Behind the smile, which tells the story. But just tell us a little bit about your own experience, and in particular, whether you yourself have experienced racism. So um, I have experienced racism. Um, as I said, I was born in France, went to Congo, came back um, to France, and where we were living. So we were living. Um, if you do know kind of your geography of France. We were living in Lille, which is near Calais. Um, at the time, it was predominantly white. So when I went to school, um, there was a few black people, so not much to reference yourself to. So um, I just remember being <coughs> in a classroom where I think I was the only black girl. Um, at times, no one wanted to sit next to me. Um, no one wanted to hold my hand when it was time to kind of, you know, do uh, activities and walk to the park or doing just, you know, walking to an activity with the class. No one wanted to hold my hand. It was like, and the look on their face was like disgust. And that was the first time I actually experienced that because I was just thinking, I'm human. What is this? Um, and this, all the comments, obviously, why is your nose like this? Why is your lips like this? Um, also, you know, just comments, how do you live, do you used to live in a, you know, in a hut? And I was thinking, that's a bit strange, because I remember living in a house when I was in Africa, so why do they think that way? So I just felt very insulted, because I was thinking, I don't understand. And then you, as, you, as I grew older, then you have, you know, in, in secondary school, you have people trying to, what they think is imitating African accents. So they speak to you, um, you know, in some of, it's not even a proper African accent, but that's what they would do to mock you. Um, you know, you will pass and then people will ask you, oh, do you, want a, do you want a banana? Obviously in reference to monkeys. I don't, I can't remember how many times I was asked a day if I wanted a banana and I was, for me it was very strange. Um, but then it got me questioning myself as well. I was fine in my skin and all of a sudden now I'm thinking, oh yeah, my nose is quite big. <laughs> oh yeah, my lips are quite big. So, but I never had that. I never thought of anything. I just thought, okay, I'm human. But now their comments made me question myself, um, kind of, you know, identity, uh, thinking, oh yeah, maybe, oh yeah, maybe I should be a bit lighter. Maybe if I was a bit lighter, maybe someone would be my friend. Um, but it was, it, was, it was very oppressing at times because you don't know who to turn to because in France, I know in France when I experienced that, even people from North Africa are quite racist towards the, what we would say the black Africa. So I was thinking, but we're from the same continent. How do you then side mm -hmm. with them to now oppress you know, black people? So that, that, that was my experience and of recent, I think five years ago, I went to Bulgaria and I think that's probably, that's very vivid in my memory is um, we were at the supermarket with a friend. And in Bulgaria? In Bulgaria, yes. Um, first of all, we went to the, the, the beach and as we went on the beach, everybody turned towards us. And I was just thinking, Whoop, that's very odd. But then I looked across the beach, there was no black people. So I was just thinking, wow. And even my children started feeling uncomfortable because the, all eyes were on us. Uh, we even had people stop and ask if they could take pictures with us. And I'm thinking, I'm not a celebrity. Well, none of us is a celebrity, but they insisted. So one of my friends did take a picture with them. Um, but that same, I think it's that same evening or the, the next day we went to the supermarket, it was Lidl. And I was just standing, waiting to pay for my shopping, and um, a gentleman just pushed his trolley. Um, you know, he just bashed into me with his trolley, and I thought, you know, it happens. Sometimes your trolley just slips. You came a bit too strong. Um, so I turned around and I looked at him. He didn't apologize, nothing, and he did it again. But this time, I saw him do it very, didn't you know, happen. with force. So I, I moved, and, and my friend who was in front of me said, "What's happening?" I said, I don't understand what's happening. And then he started speaking, obviously, their language. But from his language, I could tell that what he was saying wasn't nice. I, I could just tell. And then the, the cashier lady was looking, looking at him, looking at me and putting her head down. And I could tell that what he's saying is not nice. And she's also not wanted to take part in it. But then I was thinking, what's happening here? 
it's now we were I think when we were in Bulgaria it was 2018 mm -hmm. 2018 I think it's 2018 how can this happen so I was boiling inside of me and I'm gonna say how were you yeah yeah so I was very angry and I started shouting um, no one came so this man was now shouting at me in his language. I'm then shouting because I'm, I'm so angry. Security guard is right where he is. No one is coming. No one is trying to stop him or anything. And this is how it all ended. I walked out. I had to sit in the car and I wanted to cry. But it's crying out of anger, crying out of, the, I, I can't believe this is happening in 2018. Um, and it just makes you feel very little because no one came to the rescue. So it makes you feel very little and, and powerless. Mm. That's how I felt. Wow, what a story. Terrible. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now, I mean, you're a Christian, you're a believer. How do you, I don't, I don't know, what, how do you sense what God is saying through all this? What's he saying to you? Is, did, did he, at the end of that, did you say, Lord, why is this happening? What's going on? I think when I sat in the car, you know, kind of teary, um, I just asked God to calm me because I'm not a, f a fighter or someone, but you kind of, that rage that boils inside of you makes you want to do something. And I, I just said, Lord, just calm me because at this point, I don't want to come out of who I am because that's not who I am. I'm not, I'm a peaceful person. I don't want to come out of who I am just to prove a point. He's the one who is ignorant and showing his ignorance and obviously not behaving in a way that I would expect a human being to behave. Um, I, just, I just had to pray for peace. I think I just remember just having to just, right. you know, internalize and pray for peace, yes. But it must make you worried because I suspect that what you've just described in Bulgaria does happen in the United Kingdom and, and you've got children who are growing up mm -hmm. um, in, in that kind of environment and therefore the danger is that they're going to uh, be inflicted as well with that kind of rage against them. That's very true, yes. Tim, I mean, we talk about being a Christian nation. We talk about the United Kingdom as being um, a, a place where our, our Judo-Christian heritage is very important to us. But I came across a quote where the Reverend uh, Justin, most Reverend Justin um, Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, said at a meeting of the church's ruling body, the General Synod, that he was ashamed of our history of racism. Mm. And he said, uh, that we needed to stamp out conscious or unconscious racism. And uh, he w go, it, the article went on to describe within the Church of England and even amongst clergymen, uh, particularly where uh, young black men were seeking to become curates for their finding such prejudice. How, how, do we, how do we explain away what's happening? Yeah, it, it, uh, Clifford Hill mentioned it, we've mentioned it, you know, the. The, the church is seg segregated on a Sunday morning and you have to work hard to overcome decades, centuries of, of prejudice. I would say that um, not in any way diminishing every incident that happens over here. And I've had friends, Indian friends, who have been terribly abused on the streets, beaten up, you know, really good upstanding folk um, and so it's still going on in this country anti-semitism is still going on in this country but there's something about you know eastern europe because they don't have so much interface with and there is a lot of sort of rabble rousing and you know nationalism um, especially against immigration that countries like bulgaria you know romania i i i I've, I've got friends in both ukraine and russia because they don't have much in, uh, interface with, you know, they, you know, sometimes I wince that they're, they're talking about Jews, they're talking about blacks, it, uh, it, just normal conversation, mocking. Now that comes from, you know, never really getting to know them. And I think that the solution in the church, and, and we've never had an issue on Rev TV because, you know, we've got such a mixed um, viewership. And when we go to Israel, we just have such fun together. There, there literally is no, yeah. you know, we're all colorblind um, in that regard. So I would say that, you know, we talk about Rev TV being church without walls. And the key 
you know, a scripture is that the Lord has broken down the wall of hostility in his body. We're all one in Christ. And I think that, you know, folks have to question whether they really believe the Bible if they've got a prejudice uh, towards folks. But I definitely think the solution is friendship, relationship, engagement, you know, so that it isn't someone that you don't know who's far away. It's someone who's your friend and your children's friends and you're interacting together. That, is, that has to be the solution. Yeah, I, I was doing a, a count up of uh, Revelation uh, a little while back. Uh, and apart from people from, uh, from the UK and Spain, we had Sudan, we had uh, Ghana. Uh, Nigeria, these are people who are on our staff team. And they're actually they're better, I, I, you, it, you can't make value judgments, but often they're better folk than us. They've got, they've got more fun, they've got you know, more life, more spiritual life, more yeah. depth of relationship with the Lord. And, and there is something in the British, when I say the British, you know what I mean, the, the old traditional white English psyche, which is very stiff upper lip and it's reserved. And, and I wondered when I saw the title of your book, Behind the Smile, whether it could apply to British people who are very polite to your face <laughs> and then behind your back, you know, they, they will say nasty things. And I've heard it and it's embarrassing and I agree with Justin Welby on this. And, you know, the question is what, what you do about it and you just have to challenge it whenever you see it. Um, but I, I do think it's not just a, a church thing. Um, it's not just a British thing, but I do think that there's, there's an intellectual racism which does have to be addressed as well. But, but, but also, it, it's, is it not helped by sometimes when you go to other countries, the, the impression that the white person is in some way superior? Mm -hmm. uh, Lorna and I went to, to Trinidad for six months. Um, and, and often on, on a Sunday, we would go uh, to other churches. Now, if we went to another church in, in Trinidad, um, immediately we were spotted. Then the, the, the minister or the person at the front was instructed the uh, ushers to bring us to the front row. <laughs> now, we didn't want to go to the front row because the services were four hours and we might want to, to, to leave before the That's end. That's exactly but, what Clifford was saying about yeah. the hierarchy. Yes. You know, yeah, isn't that White interesting? White supremacy. Yeah. Uh, is, is that a fair comment? It is because um, in, so, in some countries, um, so I've, I've visited um, Italy, Venice, I went to Venice, and a lot of um, black people there are, no, I wouldn't say a lot, but the, the ones I saw um, were selling on the streets. So you could see that if this, you could see why they would think that black people are just, you know, kind of street vendors, if, if I can say it that way. So they, they, they think that they obviously have one up because they, they're not doing what they're doing. And obviously the job they, the job they choose to do, and they're obviously immigrants, um, it's not very rewarding. Um, and it's obviously, again, not, you know, it's, it's the immigrant status that, that sometimes they see a black person and they think, oh, you, you, you're illegal. Or so. There's something, there's something there that there's a stigma there that a black person is an immigrant. You have no, that, this is what you're good at. And yes, and like you said as well, there, is, there are some certain countries where the white people are seen like, a, you know, very high. And I, I can just picture this being, you know, being white, walking in the church and being walked to the front. I can, you know, I can, I can just picture that as well. Embarrassing. It's even worse in India, by the way. <laughs> you know, you're just, you're, you're treated like a royalty and you're given garlands and it, it, it can be a bit. Yeah. Uh, well, I wish we had uh, our emails and texts working tonight because we'd love to hear from you and uh, we'd uh, read them. I'm just being told some of them have come through to my phone. Let me just see what we've got here. And mm. uh, oh, that would be great if we, if we have. Mm. Uh, yeah, OK. L right. Let, let's, have a, let's have a go. See what we've got here. And uh, this one is uh, Dig Gordon and Tim and Paulette. I'm not prejudiced, just to say what gypsies, they are persecuted and judged terribly. Mm -hmm. It's very sad, mm -hmm. okay? That's a, yeah, equally applies there. Mm -hmm. And uh, here's another one which says, the church I attend as a white pastor 
ha oh, has a white pastor and a black pastor. The church has about 300 members of fix mixed races. That's great. And, and this one says, um, from Alex in Scotland, dear hi, uh, Gordon, Tim and Paulette, lovely to see you, emotional subject. I experienced racism as a young child up to adulthood as an English child in 1970 and 80s Scotland with an English accident, accent, mm -hmm. not big, but felt awful. It felt abusive. It did make me more understanding of others. I found some churches not racist, but classist or clique, just as sad to experience what we, what, when we want to fit in. We're all one in Christ, said Alex from Scotland. Interesting. I mean, yeah. we, we're talking about it from a colour point of view, but he, he's saying it's, it's from your accent point of view that mm -hmm. you can be prejudiced, mm -hmm. which is... Uh, and could, I, could I mention, I was over in the States um, in, in the summer, and there's two, two places I visited which is very interesting. One was a place called Harper's Ferry, which is... Uh, there are two great rivers going into Washington. You've got the Potomac and you've got the Shenandoah. And at, at that point, there was you know, riots um, before the American Civil War um, fighting for the rights of, of black workers. Um, a chap called John Smith, um, famous for the song, John Smith's Body Lies a Mouldering in the Grave. And, and it, it did trigger something, you know, all those years, 1860s in, in America, um, which led to the great, you know, the great speeches of Abraham Lincoln, you know, and the Gettysburg Address and the like. Um, so, but that's how many years ago now? That's, you know, Clifford Hill was the 1960s. That's 100 years before. How long it takes to get rid of prejudice. And another place I visited was down in Nashville where um, Vanderbilt University is. And, and there in the middle was this house that belonged to a slave trader called Isaac Franklin. And, and bear in mind, these folk were um, good Christians of their day. He traded 25,000 slaves. Um, you, you know, the, it, it's horrific. And, and this, the kind of prejudice of spitting or mocking someone or saying words, uh, you know, that is the thin end of a wedge. And the wider end of that wedge is actually bloodshed and worse. Uh, and, uh, you know, what, what happened? You read a little bit about, um, you know, from your book. And I think that... When we see prejudice, I, it has to be zero, zero tolerance. You can't, you know, just, you know, I, I, either you're among the mockers and the scoffers or you're the one who stands um, alongside those, the victims. And I think that's the choice we have to make as Christians. Mm -hmm. And the Lord Jesus never tolerated it. And his story of the Good Samaritan was all about racism. Yeah. It, was, it was really an ethnic issue. And he gave the story of the Good Samaritan who went out of his way to help someone not of his race. Well, it was lovely to read that, that email which talked about the church with a, a black pastor and, and a white pastor. S sadly, that doesn't seem to be the case too often. It tends to be um, the church is predominantly white or, or the church is predominantly black. And, and certainly Cliff uh, says in his, his interview that, that the church in this country is, is carried by the black churches, which are being uh, so successful in, in terms of, of reaching people and sharing the gospel with them. But, but you're part of a church which, which certainly from my limited knowledge of churches in, in the London area, has been successful in terms of integration and uh, people from so many different races who go to it. Kensington Temple, could you tell us a little bit about it? Most definitely. So um, Kensington Temple is definitely a multicultural church. Um, everyone is welcome. That's, that's how I know the church to be, uh, whether it is in the youth ministry, children ministry, and just as a church, it's very welcoming. Um, I don't, on top of my head, I can't remember how many uh, nationalities we have, but we definitely have a lot of black um, nationalities, such as uh, Nigerian, Ghanaians, we have Eritreans, and I am missing probably some more, but the, it is very much uh, multicultural, and our leadership as well, 
um, is uh, multicultural. We, we do have uh, white pastors and black pastors as well, and we do have uh, um, female pastors, which is great as well for identification. Mm. So why do you think you've managed to do it as a church? And I don't mean you personally, but, <laughs> but, but why has the church been able to do this when it seems to find difficult to be done in other places? I mean, the, what I like about uh, Kensington Temple is that we do have on a Saturday uh, celebrations of different countries. So I feel having that going on, you know, when uh, you know, we celebrate Nigeria, we celebrate um, the West Indies, it does help to bring people and see that obviously, you know, everyone is welcome. Um, I think that was probably done um, in a way of evangelism as well, which obviously people will come and see that, oh, there are West Indians here, oh, they are Jamaicans, they are, um, you know, Ghanaians and Nigerians in the church. So they feel welcome. That's why I said Kensington Temple is very welcoming to all nationalities and, and having celebrations to celebrate those nationalities is definitely part of the growth um, and the integration of that church. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And, and so you're part of a church where it's been successful. What would you say to folks who are listening tonight who, who are saying, well, I, I, I'm in a church and we just don't seem to be able to attract other people in our neighbourhood of a different race and a different culture? How, how would you encourage them? Again, I would say have special nights. I think it's, it's important to celebrate cultures. So if you are in, a, you know, in an area where you, know, you kind of have different nationalities, but the church is only attending to a certain nationality, host events. It's important to, for people to feel as though you care, not just about their, you know, their spiritual life, but also where they come from. Um, so it's good to you know, kind of have special events. I know it can't always happen um, you know, kind of on a monthly basis, but it's important for people to feel that the church is also a place where nationalities are celebrated and everybody's welcome again. That's, I think that's something very important. Okay, well let's just think about some of the scriptures that uh, apply. But uh, let, let me, we've got one that's come in, Galatians 3, 28. Mm. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And Romans 2, 11, God shows no partiality. Mm. And this email says, if you read Numbers 12, 1 to 16, about Miriam and Aaron speaking against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he married, you can find out how God uh, responded. And um, here's someone, a question for you, Paulette. Um, my question to Paulette is, as our Christian sister, has she forgiven the man in Bulgaria and anyone else who wronged her? And does Paulette, like us, as, like us Christians, trust God to act justly in his way and timing? Thank you for this program. As a white Christian, I grew up watching the TV series Roots, which moved me very much, and I'm thankful to God that we're all made in his image. Shalom, every blessing to you all. Uh, I mean, you, you said at the time you felt such, such anger and you prayed for peace, but have you found easy, do you find it easy to forgive when you get? Yes, because um, I think for me, the, I, I just understand that some some behavior come from ignorance um, and fear. So I, I can go back in, and reflect and, and see that I don't know him, he doesn't know me. His fear of me and his ignorance of who I am made him react in the way he did. Um, but this could be someone I sit down and have a coffee with and we have a great conversation. So I just have to kind of park it and, be, and say, Lord, I know you made me and I have the right to be on this earth. So no matter how someone, see, someone else sees me or feels about me, I cannot carry that. You took it on the cross. I cannot live in, you know, kind of angry and bitter because at the end of the day, like the person said, you know, God is a God of justice. So no matter what, um, we always seek the justice of God. We don't seek our own justice because our own justice is never just anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just, I just, I may have not prayed for forgiveness per se, but I know that with God, you're able to do a work where your heart is softened towards people's ignorance and you're able to have compassion because 
it's not a nice thing to be ignorant. It's, no. it's not no. to his benefit. You, you're involved in youth work now at, at Kensington Temple. Are, are you finding that the young people are coming in and, and discussing uh, the racism? Is it, a, is it something that is being shared about amongst the young people? And what do you say to them? I don't think we have gone on to that topic, but if a question was ever raised about racism, um, we will always definitely bring it back to the Bible. But it's also understanding because at times racist, the word racism is thrown, you know, in a way that when you assess the situation is not actually racism. So it's always trying to get an understanding of what they mean by racism, just as we, we um, you know, were able to define in, at the beginning what's the definition of racism. Um, it's important, and, and I know for young people it's important to talk, but it's also important for them to understand what it means, but also to refer them back to their identity in Christ, because that's Very what good. matters at the end of the day. Um, and as uh, youth leaders, we are, I feel that we represent them well, because they are white leaders, they are black leaders, they are male, they are female, so they're able to see that the ministry is not just about black people, though the majority of young people we have are black um you know they're black people um but we are a mixture just like the main church we are a mixture of colors which okay we well according to this email 119 different nationality nationalities wow. are in, at kt wow. hello i'm just watching your program and heard Paulette referring to my church kt mm. we are about 119 nationalities Amazing. we currently have two white pastors and two black pastors. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is from Rita and she says, I've personally been going there since the late 80s. And as a European German person, have always mixed with many black races. Currently I'm hosting a Ugandan pastor and we're watching the program together. We say hi, Thank lovely you. to have you with us, both of you. And um, forgive me if I'm wrong, says uh, June. I've just switched on, as you know, I'm Scottish. You probably won't like my comments, but they're accurate. You might even like the way, you might not even like the way I express it. I find that Scottish people are not well tolerated by the English. History has been changed and we are the underdog. I had an ancient relative shot for he was discovered up a tree reading his Bible. This was mm. illegal. You also tried to make us Anglican and stop us being Presbyterian. About 200 yards from my house is one of the places for Scots people met to worship and to hide from the English because they were worshiping by Presbyterianism. Maybe if our history was taught, it would be easier. Mm. Thank you, June, for, bad, for that. Bad things have happened, bad things have happened. Mm. I, I wanna make a point, which I, I think we'll all agree with that, you know, um, anti-racism, as it were, has been hijacked by those who don't want any discrimination on a moral basis. So I, I think it's one of the terrible things of our time that they've diluted the fight against racism by basically saying, well, we shouldn't discriminate against on any on any moral issue. Um, and so and that's a real problem because you, you the Bible is very clear, you know, that God's created us, you know, with a clear definition of what's right and what's wrong. And, you know, people say, oh, no, no, yes, that's the same prejudice as racism. Absolutely not. And I think that we, we need to sort of fight together on that one, because if you don't have right and wrong, uh, you know, being defined and discriminated between the two. You know, th that's the thin end of the wedge as well that will lead to savagery. Mm. Mm. So the important thing is that we learn to pray for one another. Let me, as we come towards the end of a program, just share some scriptures with you. If you've got a pen, you might want to write them down. John 7, 24, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. James 2, 9, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressions. Acts 12, uh, 10, 34, so Peter opened his mouth and said, truly I understand that God shows no partiality. Excellent. And perhaps the greatest one, John three sixteen. God so loved Amen. the world. Amen. Well, there's so much that we could be talking about tonight. Thank you so much for sharing in the programme, for those emails that we've been able to receive. Paulette, thank you so much for coming. And let me just remind you, if you want to know more about Paulette's uh, life and experience, behind the smile. And Tim, 
It's always a pleasure to have pleasure, you and your special pleasure to be here with Paulette. And I look forward to being with you tomorrow morning, 10.30. But thank you for being with us. Hope you have a good night if you're watching the live program. And we'll see you again soon. God bless. Bye-bye.